Hi. Um, not really sure who I'm talking to today. Raf uh, suggested perhaps I, I I do the get a show of hands thing and and uh, ask how many of you have played a video game. All right, we're on pretty safe common ground there. How many of you have played a massively multiplayer online video game? Still looking pretty good, okay. How many of you have uh, bought or sold virtual currencies online? All right, all right, a little more explaining to do there. Um, and uh, how many of you uh, have read the most recent issue of Game Studies Journal. Oh, well, actually more of you than have bought virtual currencies, I think. All right, and, and, and I wouldn't actually be able to raise my hand there, but since I'm going to be, uh, as the subtitle there indicates, um, I, part of my, the, 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 the ultimate thrust of my talk today is the uh, field of game studies and its possibilities and, and possible scope. Um, so there's going to be a, a little bit of inside baseball here probably for, for those of you who aren't regular readers of game studies and other ludological publications. Um, but uh, I hope even that part might be enlightening. Uh, so, so this here is the title of my talk today, Play Money, Gold Farms, Polar Bear Rugs, and the World Historical Relevance of Game Studies. Uh, that's a pretty pretentious subtitle, but I needed to uh, sort of counterbalance the, the subtitle of the book it's based on, uh, that much of my uh, talk is going to be based on today, uh, uh, rather uh, more trade press uh, subtitle there. Um, and I, of course, I mention uh, the book only to give you a sort of intellectual context for my remarks today and not for any other uh, <laughs> ulterior <laughs> reason. Okay. Um, the, uh, the book itself is based on a work with an, uh, of the same name with an even uh, more humble and less pretentious uh, subtitle, which is the blog I kept during the year I attempted to make a living um, online. This is the actual dubious proposition in question. Um, and uh, later on, I'll, I'll be filling you in a little bit more on, on how, that, how that worked out. Um, but for now, I, I want to uh, show you another a possibly dubious proposition that that is is part of the thrust of my talk today, and this is to talk about what I learned from during that year um, on a deeper level um, about play and its relationship to money uh, in this day and age. And and it's it's this proposition or suggestion that uh, to understand the way economies and wealth and value are working today and labor and production, we need to understand uh, more and more play and games because they are becoming an increasingly uh, influential and constitutive part of the contemporary material world. Um, now, those of you who, who have followed you know, the field of game studies um, will recognize that statement as a typical you know, bold attempt to establish the importance, the significance of, of video games as against you know, the, the, the myriad pundits and uh, authorities who will tell you that video games are a silly waste of time or even dangerous to the nation's youth. Um, uh, a, an excellent scholar named Henry Jenkins has made sort of a career of trying to point out that, you know, uh, video games actually are important culture. Um, and uh, seven years ago, he was sort of suggesting that video games may be sort of the, uh, you know, the great cultural form of, of our age. And, and scholars are continuing to... Uh, uh, 
echo that theme. This is Mackenzie work, a very excellent work of scholarship I'll come back to later, but he's, he's uh, beating the same drum here. Um, another version of that, of course, is, hey, uh, video games are bigger than movies financially uh, and economically, so they must be really important culturally. Um, those uh, of you who have, who have followed this particular meme closely will recognize the sleight of hand in the last clause there. More than the Hollywood box office, uh, many people were called out trying to claim that the games industry was uh, bigger than the movie industry, uh, and, and people pointed out, well, that's only if you compare the entire game industry revenues to just the Hollywood box office receipts of the movie industry, which are a small percentage of the movie industry's entire revenues. But nonetheless, you get the point. Um, there is a general sort of froth of attempts uh, and statements uh, aimed at um, establishing the significance of video games, the importance, um, the heft uh, of video games. And, and I will be adding to that froth, but hopefully um, suggesting in a, in, a, in a rigorous or at least substantial way that uh, these statements don't really go far enough, that there is much more to say about the importance of games than merely comparing it to other cultural forms uh, is capable of doing. Um, but before we get to all that, I've got a lot to explain. I want to start with some particulars. Um, and again, those of, we had some hands go up on the massively multiplayer online role-playing game. So that's, this is how we abbreviate it, massively multiplayer online role-playing game, MMORPG. Uh, unfortunately, if you try to pronounce that, it comes out more pig. Um, so we generally try to just call them MMOs these days. Um, what are MMOs? Well, if you, any of you are familiar with these games, EverQuest 2, Lineage, City of Heroes, Star Wars Galaxies, Dark Age of Camelot, these are uh, uh, networked games uh, that involve uh, interaction of thousands of players in fantasy settings, either a strict Tolkien-esque type of setting or a comic book setting or a science fictional setting. Um, all attempting to progress through that world, up a sort of ladder of progress, attain better and better uh, items with which to kill bigger monsters and therefore attain even better items and so forth. It's kind of a, uh, you know, a treadmill, if you will, Not very similar to the, the standard economic one. I'm going to turn my phone back on at the risk of noisy interruptions because I don't have a clock up here otherwise when I don't want to waste too much of your time. Um, anyway, these are the, oh, there we go. Thank you, Mike. Thank you, Verizon. Um, so these are the games, um, uh, but the one, of course, that you know we're all <laughs> hearing about these days is World of Warcraft. Um, why? Because the numbers: eight million players is the latest uh, figure, a uh, billion dollars in revenues. This just knocks any of the previous games out of the park. Um, you know. Lineage, maybe two million players, uh, and who knows how they're measuring that. Eight million players is a really solid uh, population figure for the number of people playing World of Warcraft. That's like one in every thousand people on the planet or something like that. A uh, billion dollars in revenues also is a huge amount of money. Um, and so, so that those kind of numbers are sort of reviving, again, the, you know, the meme of, hey, you know, are we there yet? Are we, have we surpassed? <laughs> the movie industry. Um, I don't know if that's the case or if it will soon be the case, but I want to suggest even on the sort of uh, crass commercial economic uh, level that there, there, there are other indices um, that we can look at. Um, any of you familiar with this acronym? 
Yes, to, uh, no, it's the, uh, I, that's probably because I made it up. It's the, I call it the Shanghai Taxi Weirdness Index. Um, and I base it on uh, an experience, um, a recent visit to Shanghai where I got into a taxi with Jingle, actually, who will be speaking to us a little later. Um, and um, as if it wasn't weird enough that they have televisions in the taxis there that you can watch as you're driving around, um, on comes this, uh, this uh, commercial for... Ah. Coca-Cola that features um, the Taiwanese uh, pop girl band She um, sitting around their fabulous apartment um, drinking coke and then these characters from World of Warcraft bust out of the laptop and come in and you know ravage them and uh, take their coke and um, <laughs> And, and carry them off back to the world of Azeroth, uh, which is the fictional world in which World of Warcraft takes place. And oh my god, but that's not the end of it. This, in the taxi, this went on to offer uh, to the viewer the option of calling in to vote for one of three possible endings for this commercial. Uh, one of which, in one of which, uh, the uh, Portuguese football hottie uh, Cristiano Ronaldo uh, comes into the world of Azeroth dressed in, you know, uh, Tolkien-esque uh, soccer gear, and uh, you know, kicks a spiked uh, football at the orc who's, you know, captured them and knocks them over and, and rescues she. Um, in the in the second version. Um, the winner of the Chinese Idol contest, Li Yuqin was yeah, her name? Uh, yeah, you know, a cute little uh, uh, punk-haired uh, singer who was huge. Every girl in China that I saw had the same haircut. Um, she comes and she rides in on her, you know, on her epic mount or whatever, and uh, she, you know, does some magic and, and rescues uh, the girls of she. And then option three was the, you know, feminist self empowerment version in which the girls of she rescue themselves. Um, so uh, this, in a country in which you know the population of WoW players is three million, which is more than uh, in the U.S., but proportionally, it's it's actually a smaller percentage. But you know, here in the U.S., World of Warcraft is the object of South Park um, mockery at best. Uh, in China, however, uh, well, let's look at what's going on here. You've got the world's number one brand, Coca-Cola, uh, desperately trying to align itself with various figures from the pop cultural landscape of, of China. And so they've got the record industry celebrities, yes. They've got the television idol. They've got the sports world hero. They've got, strangely, the geeky role-playing game characters. Uh, the movie star of the moment, nowhere to be seen. So, you know, there are other ways of measuring significance here. And that was just kind of besides the hilarity of the commercial, kind of a, a limbering up exercise for us all to start thinking along different vectors in terms of understanding the hugeness of uh, video games, whether it's particular video games or video games in general. So World of Warcraft is the one everyone's talking about. The one I want to talk about is the one I attempted to milk a real life living from for a year, a game whose effective author we have the privilege of uh, joining with uh, us here, Raf Koster, who will be responding to us today, um, basically oversaw the creation of this game, Ultima Online. He was not he had left by the time this part of the world was created, so I don't know if he's he's getting a, a, tear, a teary eye right now looking at this, remembering his good times there. Anyway, this is the city of Luna, which is a sort of commercial city uh, in the world of Britannia, which is the fictional world of Ultima Online, which is the, the oldest of the successful graphic, massively multiplayer online games. Um, and that little dude on the... Beetle on the blue beetle in the middle. That's my character. 
Um, and this sort of, uh, I wonder if this pointer will do a damn thing for me. Uh, oh, yeah. So this here is, uh, this is my house. I constructed this house, uh, designed it anyway, and was rather proud of how it came out. Um, I also uh, was attempting to use it, as people tend to uh, with their houses, to uh, make money, to sell some of the, this type of virtual item here in my backpack, put them on these, these kind of robot characters that I'd set up in front of my house. These are vendors, and other players will come along, and if they like the goods, they will, uh, they will pay virtual gold. Here you see the little pile of virtual gold in my backpack. Uh, they will fork over some virtual gold uh, in order to get the stuff, and I will amass more virtual gold with which to get more stuff. Um, now, uh, that was my house, but it was not my only house in the game. Now, we're, we're going to take a little walk through Luna now, through the magic of uh, PowerPoint pseudo animation, and come around here to this other part of the city. Now, this... I have to blind myself with this laser. Uh, this big place used to be mine. As you can see, uh, the person who bought it from me is making a much bigger go of attempting to make money. This house is actually full of vendors like this, and he's also got vendors set up over here on the other side and over here. He bought up this plot. It's basically setting up a shopping mall in the corner of, of Luna. It turns out the guy that bought this from me was the richest man in the game in terms of uh, virtual gold pieces. Apparently he, had, he owned about a third of the money supply in the, in the server. Um, anyway, uh, I, I'm showing you these to, uh, to sort of uh, give you a sense of how these virtual economies work um, and how valuation works in them. Uh, the house, uh, what is the value of the house in, in virtual terms? Uh, well, uh, the price that we agreed on after some haggling was 20 million gold pieces and a east-facing polar bear rug. Um, and I always hear a few little titters out there. Oh yeah, like that, you know, means anything. Well, uh, that's why we're now going to uh, look at another phenomenon. Um, Show of hands, who's familiar with this particular acronym? Okay, so the, the idea is getting out there. This is uh, RMT refers to what's called real money trading, and that is the sale of virtual items for quote unquote real money. And you'll see why I use the quotes in a little while. Um, typically, or originally, no longer. Um, because as of two weeks ago, uh, eBay, or last week actually, eBay banned the sale of virtual items um, in its precincts for, for complicated reasons. Um, but when it was permitted, Ultima Online had one of the more robust sections. You can see here, uh, this is... In this category, 2,285 items are for sale. Um, and those are real dollar figures uh, next to the items. And that allows us to start translating the value of you know, 2 million gold pieces and a virtual polar bear rug into something you snickerers might begin to appreciate. Uh, there's, this is a few years ago. Um, there's five million gold pieces that's selling for a hundred dollars. So, and uh, that was a pretty standard price at the time. Um, so we can, and so steady, standard enough that you could sort of really talk about a, 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 a reliable exchange rate um, for the Britannian gold piece. Um, and furthermore, you could compare it to things like the Romanian Leo, which uh, which had, wasn't quite as strong as, or the Turkish lira, which was doing much better then at the time, um, and begin to see that, well, 
what's the difference? I mean, you know, they all have exchange rates, so uh, isn't the Britannian gold piece really just another kind of currency out there with slightly different backing? Um, that would be my argument. That's why I put quotes around real money and real money trading, because it's all either real or, or virtual when you get right down to it. Uh, but so, so, but that's easy to understand, money to money, a currency exchange. But the polar bear rug, come on, nobody's, and that gives us a figure of, you know, $400 for the amount of gold pieces that I was given for the house. Uh, the polar bear rug, though, yes, you can find or you could find a, a rare polar bear rug. Um, and the price there was $25. And let's just check and make sure that's really what we're, yes, the east-facing polar bear rug, that's the one, little picture of the item right there on, on eBay. Uh, and so that's worth $25. And now you can start understanding the value of that house in terms that travel beyond the boundaries of Ultima Online and the virtual world. Um, and you can say through the, you know, the transitive magic properties of economics that the value of that house in real money terms is $425. Well, what can we do with that kind of information? One thing we can do is economics. Um, and economist Edward Castronova, several years back, um, did just that. He went into uh, the game EverQuest and um, looked at the prices on eBay of the items in the game EverQuest and did a lot of research within the game to establish the rate at which players were accumulating these magical and virtual items, um, you know, going out into the wilderness to slay monsters and get the magical stuff off of their corpses or going into the hills to mine certain kinds of ingots and so forth, all of this kind of play that was producing value. Um, if you do that with a real economy, what you get is the gross domestic product of the given economy. And Castronova was able to establish that in the strictest of econometric terms, EverQuest had a gross national product and it was $135 million, um, which on the global scheme of things is not a huge GNP, but if you broke it down per capita, it's a small population, uh, you had a GNP per capita per player of $2,260, um, which at the time was slightly less than the tiny island nation of St. Vincent was racking up. Uh, a little better than Russia, uh, and much better than big powers like China and India, um, allowing those of us at Wired Magazine to write cute headlines like this. Um, so, and the legitimacy of that claim can be debated or not, but, you know, what's most interesting about that is that if you stay within the strictest uh, terms of economics and econometrics, it's, it's undebatable. What, what you have to do is start then interrogating economics, you know, and, and asking, well, what they, is what they place on, value on always, you know, an appropriate thing to place on. But from an econometric point of view, this is a legitimate move. Um, but uh, there are perhaps other more pragmatic things we can do with this information about how RMT works and how value spills out of virtual worlds into the, into the real economy, uh, and that is make some money. The total revenues from uh, real money trading worldwide, the best estimate we have, because it's basically the only concrete estimate we've had in the last few years, is uh, $880 million. It's probably more than that. Um, but it's a lot of money. And it, in terms of individuals, um, there is the potential to make a lot of money working in this field. Um, I spoke to some who credibly claim to be making over a million dollars a year. Certainly some uh, companies that have moved into this space uh, are, are uh, 
uh, making profits on at least on that order, um, maybe into the hundreds of millions. Um, but uh, then there's my case. I promise to uh, <laughs> tell you how this worked out. Um, put it this way, there was a steep learning curve. Um, but in the last few months, I was making a lot of money in Ultima Online, basically by buying and selling. I would go into the game and find people who were selling <laughs> items uh, that I knew I could sell for more on eBay, or they would be selling it for a certain quantity of gold, and I would do the math in my head, well, that much gold equals that many dollars, and I can sell it for twice that much on eBay or on my website, and that's how I did it. Uh, and by the end, I was uh, earning profits of about $3,900 a month, um, which annualizes out nicely, $47,000 a year. Uh, not more than I had made as a writer up to that point, but strangely more than I made since. So maybe, <laughs> maybe I made the wrong choice in abandoning this project, but the book had to be written, uh, and, uh, and abandon it I did. Uh, but I, I, again, I want to emphasize that uh, there are definitely people making more money, and, and using a variety of techniques and business models, um, and I want to share a couple of those. Uh, one guy I talked to uh, during this time was a guy named Richard Thurman, who made $80,000 in the year I spoke to him on the side. He had a well-paying job as a software um, consultant. Um, but uh, nights he would come home and tend to his army of robot workers. Um, he would program characters in Ultima Online to uh, do these sort of tedious crafting and hunting things and go to the vendors and sell the money. And, and then he would also, you know, learn ways to, you know, have them figure out, well, if I buy from this vendor and sell to that vendor, I can actually make a lot of gold um, just by running a program over and over. So he, this was his closet. Um, he had, at the time, 20, like 21 computers, each one running Ultima Online, each one with a, a, a robot or two um, harvesting gold, basically, inside the game. He ultimately had about 50, um, 50 machines in there. His el electricity bills were crazy. Um, and, you know, apparently you could boil an egg in there from all the heat coming out of there. Um, but it was a very efficient way of extracting value from these worlds from him. Uh, well, so this is, right, one of the standard ways to increase productivity in the modern world is to automate. You know, it's, it just goes better. The, there is another way uh, to increase productivity in this modern world, in this increasingly globalized world, and that is to seek out uh, cheap labor markets. Um, and this, as far as I know, the first person I came in contact that, that had hit on this idea was a guy named Lee Caldwell who's working up in Orange County. He had a little outfit called Black Snow Interactive, and they had hit on the idea of, well, let's go set up an office in Tijuana, right over the border here. Uh, we'll run an internet line in, we'll put up some workstations, and we'll hire 24 unskilled Mexican laborers to work in three shifts playing Ultima Online round the clock. Um, and we don't have to pay them that much, and they will gather enough loot in an hour to, you know, supply us with a healthy profit. And so they did. At the time, uh, this was four or five years ago, um, this was an uncommon phenomenon, and as I wrote about it uh, and thought about it, I struggled with, you know, what do we call this thing? Is it a virtual sweatshop? Is it a loot factory? That was my favorite, but it didn't really catch on. Uh, gold farm, however, was the term that became the term of art um, and became increasingly commonly heard um, as the phenomenon of gold farms took off in China in a huge way. As you saw, uh, China has a special relationship to these games, um, and they were able to use that to leverage that knowledge and the cheap labor rates 
um, in China to make an incredibly productive gold farm industry in China. And, and Jingle, who is doing a documentary about this, will tell you, be able to tell you more about that. Um, I just wanted to give you a sense of, of what this phenomenon is and could possibly mean. I want to show you some images and, and give you some information from my trip to a Chinese gold farm. Uh, one that uh, Jingle is is uh, working in and, and or shooting in, uh, and was gracious enough to take me to and introduce me to, um, and these are the guys, uh, the workers and their bosses, and um, I went because. I had spent years thinking about this phenomenon of the gold farm, and I really wanted to know what it could be like to work in this kind of job where work is play. I had thought that I might learn that by uh, by pursuing the uh, the play money project, um, but always in the back of my mind, I had said, "Boy, if I could just you know." experience life as a gold farm worker, that would tell me what's going on here in this strange intersection of work and play that these games um, are, are putting before us. So uh, the first thing I did when I got there was say, can I work a shift? Um, and uh, the bosses were quite gracious and allowed me to uh, pull a shift. And so I can tell you a little bit about <laughs> what it's like. Um, it's a 12-hour shift. You come in, you punch your time card in. Um, it's seven days a week. Uh, these guys were getting one day off a month. Uh, these are hard conditions. Uh, Jingle can attest to you know, whether this is representative of, of Chinese labor conditions generally. Um, but it's definitely work. <laughs> Uh, you get a 45-minute lunch break. You get the same for dinner. And if you're, uh, un you know, unfortunate enough to order a Coke, you may end up staring at another World of Warcraft character for the duration of your dinner. Um, and uh, the pay is 30 yuan. Uh, it's about three dollars and 78 cents per day. Um, here I am signing my pay slip and a happy employee at the end of the day. Um, the, they, they tend to live right in the factory building. So when they're off work, they just go upstairs and um, you know, hang out in their room, or there's a TV room and sit around watching uh, Chinese soap operas. Um, but now here is where I started to realize this, this just wasn't, You know, this wasn't the triumph of work over play. This game had not been transformed into a job for these guys in the normal sense of the word. Um, and, and, and this began to become apparent to me when I realized that uh, though this is something you can do after your shift is over, many of them, if not most of them, go downstairs to the uh, internet cafe on the first floor of the building and spend the rest of their leisure time till bedtime playing World of Warcraft, the same game they have been slaving away in um, all day. And through the optic of this bizarre phenomenon, um, I began to look back on my experience on the floor in a different light and to realize that throughout the day, as the work shift was going on, as the players were, sorry, the workers uh, were doing their jobs, there was a lot of this kind of like coming over to trade information or to encourage each other on, laughing when, you know, your character gets killed or you know, cheering you on when you conquer your enemy. And a lot of trading of information, you know, tips, or, or watching how the other person was doing it. There was something 
about this work that at the core of it still was play and that resisted this total transformation into work. And, and I began to ask the guys about it and I asked in particular a couple of guys who were quite disillusioned with the job, you know, they, they'd been there six months and at first I thought it sort of inter interesting but were, were uh, you know, were, were pretty well certain it was a dead end job and they really needed to find something else and it was just grueling and too much, you know, no, not enough time off. Um, and I said, though, you know, but nonetheless, when you're there in the fight with the monster, um, you know, and you're both, your hit points are, are both, you know, edging down to zero, um, and it's not clear who's going to win, um, and it's not clear whether, you, the, you know, the monster's going to die or you're going to die, is there any shred left of that adrenaline that you feel as a player in those moments? And they sort of looked at me like it was a stupid question and said, of course, you know, and this was the answer. We don't like to die. Um, like nobody likes to die. Um, and yet that's a strangely playful answer to come from two guys who, you know, who are completely feeling ground down by this as a job. Um, and so where I had sort of thought that going to China and seeing the gold farm finally was going to really like unravel all the puzzles for me, um, I left feeling even more puzzled and, and, and like the relationship between work and play that is uh, forming in the, in the crucible of these games um, is much more complicated and much more difficult to untangle than possible. So back I went um, as I have for, for years to try to understand these things in more theoretical terms. Um, not that that's not a theory. We don't like to die. Um, but uh, the uh, theory that first came to my mind when I heard about virtual gold farms um, was that aspect of Karl Marx's work that addresses the progressive dematerialization of um, production and indeed, you know, society and culture generally under capitalism. And this is just a, you know, this is a little line in the Communist Manifesto, but it opens a window onto that aspect of capitalism that is, um, you know, it's relentless uh, self-transformation, you know, and it's an, an endless, voracious, self-transformation, it was always looking for new ways uh, to produce and always sort of revising itself and always sort of destroying what exists to create new forms of uh, production. And that this engenders a kind of logic of, of always looking toward what does not exist yet and, and looking toward even more uh, sort of fungible ways of, of framing production. And, you know, that fungibility leads to increasing dematerialization. And so you have, you know, money itself going from gold to paper to it's finally has no basis other than the markets of the world and sort of floats around dematerialized. You have, you know, the rise of the brand as more important than the actual physical product. You have um, offshoring and globalization, all these things. Um, and that here in the gold farm was this crazy sort of, you know, crystallization of that tendency, you know, people in a factory that was really in a world that didn't exist, producing goods that didn't exist to sell, you know, for money that was going to pay for food that did exist. Um, and so that begins to explain, I think, something of what's going on in the gold farms. Uh, but I think, too, then, if you're going to look for a theoretical framework, framework to deal with this stuff, you've got to look at the technology itself, the materiality uh, that underlines video games. Um, and if you go back to Alan Turing and look at his description of sort of the essential logic of computers, um, in the abstract, they're basically, he's describing a kind of turn-based rule system that 
you know, is essentially a game, you know, in a, in a formal sense. Um, and so, uh, you know, this is a this is a point that's being beginning to be made more and more. You know, scholars like Alex Galloway and his uh, uh, work on gaming. Um, uh, Ian Bogus, for instance, too, you know, that there is a, a, a natural affinity between computers and games. And I would suggest that there is a, a kind of formal identity, actually, essential uh, sameness, equality between computers and games, and that, the, that as computers begin to spread throughout the economy, become important central engines of the, the economy, that the logic of gaming and of play begins to seep in and infiltrate as well. Um, I don't, don't want to belabor this point, um, but, but just add, I wanted to add this to show that programmers themselves um, have long recognized that, that gaming sort of is, is one of the best ways to understand the logic of, of, of computers at, at the very basic logical level. Um, but, so these are sort of, between Marx and Turing, we begin to get a sort of very abstract structural picture of what's going on, both in the economy and in the technology, um, that might, you know, sort of begin to, uh, lead towards this confusion of play and production that's, that, that the gold farms thrive on and, and, uh, crystallized, um, but it's very abstract and 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 misses the sort of psychological and social aspect. I think of, of what's going on here, um, and so for those purposes, I think Max Weber becomes uh, a very useful uh, theoretical site to return to because this is a guy who understood that process that Marx is talking about and, and, and that Marx is describing in, in very abstract terms, he understood it in historical and cultural terms as a product of a particular moment in the evolution of Western culture and thought and structures of feeling, uh, which was the Protestant Reformation, which valorized work and production in certain ways that sparked a kind of um, uh, structure of accumulation uh, that eventually began to sort of run under its own steam, right? Um, and for Weber, the tragedy of capitalism, besides all the various you know exploitations that Marx points out, is is that this initial spiritual input impetus to capitalism eventually drains out, and we're left with what he calls the iron cage you know, of modern bureaucratic society. And it's drained of meaning and blah, blah, blah. Um, and, and so he's saying there's nothing left or worse than that, and he sort of hints at this at the, in, the, in the final pages of his, his great work on the, the rise of the Protestant ethic, um, is that, you know, worse than nothing, it becomes a game. People pursue wealth as a kind of, it has the character of sport, he says. This is just a suggestion, but it begins to suggest that play really is seeping into the bedrock of these larger historical phenomena uh, in more than just sort of structural ways, in more than just ways that say, oh yeah, isn't that funny? You know, capitalism creates game-like things and computers are game-like. Weber begins to say, maybe play is really in there, not just like analogically, but really as a motive force. Um, and once you're on that kind of territory, you need to look to, I would propose, uh, the uh, theoretical perspective of Johann Heisinger, who was uh, quoted somewhat dismissively at the beginning of our, our seminar, um, and, and who, I have to say, I have to agree, in terms of his specific descriptions of what games are and, you know, and how they work, and, um, you know, he has these definitions of what games are that, that those of you who read game studies and uh, go to game studies conferences, 
no, are endlessly you know, debated and slagged and found wanting. Um, and, and I'm saying, never mind all that. What I go to Heisinger for is a perspective, less of a, uh, less of a analysis than a mantra almost. Play cannot be denied. Play is primary. Play is your basic unit of analysis. And once you've sort of made that turn, uh, then phenomena that out there in the world, like you know the things that Marx and Turing and Weber are describing, um, that don't that begin that begin to look play-like. If you understand them as actually being play, um, and actually being part of this world that video games are at the center of, they begin to be more easily understood. And that play can explain a lot of these phenomena uh, better than you know, the history of capitalism can explain what's going on with play right now. So uh, to recapitulate, if you want to understand what's going on with the gold farms, you start with Marx. You had a little Turing, a little Weber, your Heisinger. And what do you get? Well. For my immediate purposes, you get a theory. You get a theory of how to understand uh, a phenomenon uh, that people have been puzzling over and theorizing over uh, quite energetically uh, over the last few decades, um, and come up with you know various catchphrases. The uh, anthropologists John and Jean Komarov have proposed millennial capitalism for the nature of contemporary capitalism. This increasingly dematerialized, uh, increasingly phantasmatic um, form of organizing the material world. And that, you know, that goes a certain way. Um, Susan Strange, a political scientist, looking at uh, the way that the world financial markets work and the way that increasingly the great mass of economic transactions taking place are these virtual financial transactions you know, going on in commodities markets and, and futures markets and derivative markets of all kinds, suggests that actually, uh, you know, getting close to, to my analysis, that essentially capitalism is uh, structurally a game. Um, hey, you. Um, I am here simply to say that that's only going halfway, that you need to understand play uh, as increasingly really at the heart of this stuff, not just in a structural way, but in a motive kind of way and in being a kind of force that drives things. Uh, and so, so my catch word, and I offer it humbly, <laughs> To, to the gathered scholars here today, uh, is the phenomenon of ludo-capitalism. Um, take it seriously or not, but what I'm trying to do there is suggest that if you bring play into the equation, not as a phenomenon that we're using capitalism to explain, but as a phenomenon that we're using to try to explain capitalism, you begin to understand a lot of the phenomena that are going on in the world that people have scratched their heads over um, a little better. Uh, and not only that, you begin to understand where things may be going in terms of the organization of, of the economy. And, um, you know, a question and answer, I can give sort of concrete examples of that, but I'll, I'll let it suffice to, to give a little, you know, SAT uh, analogy here uh, that, you know, in, in terms of the world economy of the future, uh, play you know, may become as important as, as steam was to the 19th century as a kind of, you know, force that's been lying around for centuries unexploited that capitalism has finally figured out how to latch on to and, and make productive. Um, but that's, as I was saying, for my immediate purposes. What else does this bringing together of this universe of theorists in this particular way propose to us? And this is where... This is where I'm getting to what I was promising at the beginning. 
uh, proposing ways for the study of games and the valorization of games to go even further than it has in articulating the importance and the significance of games and play to the contemporary world, the world historical relevance, if you would. I haven't quite justified the pretentiousness of the subtitle yet, but, but we're not done yet. Uh, we're getting close, um, I promise. So what I'm suggesting for the game studies junkies here today um, is uh, that this way of thinking about capitalism that you know I has been sparked by my thinking about the virtual economies um, proposes a, a kind of stance um, that can extend uh, the power of game studies to understand the role of games in the world today. And it comes back to the anchor of that you know, chain of theorists, which is Heisinger, and, and you know, to nothing else but his simple insistence that play is primary, is an irreducible unit of analysis. Um, and those of you who followed the debates in game studies circle may may recognize this as a as a as a version of uh, of a, a move that many game scholars have pulled lately. Um, I could describe it, you know, in in words and historical terms, but but I'd rather just give you an example of a. Uh, this is the, uh, a game written by a game theorist, Jesper Yule, the first man to get a PhD in game studies. Um, and, but be, he also writes games on the side. And this is a game in which you, as a games theorist, um, are attempting to liberate games from the tyrannizing uh, grasp of other cultural disciplines. So, you know, narratology, uh, you have... Um, you know, uh, the study of uh, literature and so forth as narrative. And, you know, Yule was objecting to the ways that uh, these scholars would say, oh, games are like stories in thus and such a way. And so he's like, no way, we're going to blast that. And this is, he's, this is not a great game, but it's, it's an instructive game. Um, but so you've got your little rocket ship, and, and that's, you have to shoot, you know, these kind of narratological, um, you know, phenomenological diagrams out of the sky, and so and it's very satisfying when you do. And but you got to watch out for those little bouncy balls. That sort of I don't know what those are supposed to represent. You know, uh, uh, the struggle for tenure. I don't know. Um, but so you're you're dancing around, and then meanwhile, through every level, you know, you've got this the the, the great you know ultimate boss of theoretical imperialism coming through, and you've got to shoot that one down. That's sort of the, the will to power of other disciplines over your discipline. And you know, so you've got to fight you know, psychology, trying to understand games as, as psychological phenomenon. Film theory, and I don't know why his film theory, it's getting really hard with film theory. Maybe he had it in for film theory. Um, so you've got to shoot that out. And then pathology, which of course is, uh, I understand why that comes last and hardest, because that's what you get all the time, you know, the, the Jack Thompsons and, of the world, and, and they're, they're more informed, you know, intellectual counterparts saying, well, studies show that, you know, video games uh, make people bad and violent and all that. And so that, that turns out to be fairly easy, though, because it's a big, juicy target. And, um, and finally, you knock it out of the sky, and uh, you have triumphed, and game studies stands alone as its own thing with games and nothing else but games as its object. And uh, that's what I'm arguing for in a way, but that's just the beginning of it, you know, to say don't think of games as a subset of some other phenomenon. Don't think of play as a subset of some other phenomenon. Uh, where I would critique Yule and a lot of the other ludologists, that's what they call themselves, as opposed to the narratologists. This was a great debate. You people missed out, man. It was better than, you know, I don't know, Hatfields versus McCoys or, you know, those islands on Survivor or whatever. Um, but the, it petered out because, you know, in a way it's the form versus content debate and it, you know, it, it, it didn't really have 
much to tell us. But the ludologists, rejecting the grasp of other uh, disciplines, frequently you know, ended up with nothing to do but sort of draw up these taxonomies and ontologies of different kinds of game. It became a kind of, you know, then butterfly collecting of, of different kinds of games. It was very self-referential because what are you going to do if games don't refer out to anything and you're just going to look at how games refer to themselves. So while part of what I'm saying is is just this, what Ewell is arguing for, um, a, a return to games as a, as a primary, as its own form of analysis, or own object of analysis. Um, it's really broader than that. And uh, so let me try to flesh out this mantra of, of Heisinger's a little. First of all, Clay, Clay cannot be denied. Uh, don't try to... Um, write play out of your definitions of games. It's not going to work. What will happen is uh, you will end up with just the form of play. Games are really play seen from a formal perspective, uh, not really looking at the motive, motivations of the players. And, and when you take that out, uh, when you take play out of the definition of games, you're left with these rule-based, turn-based things that are very hard to tell the difference between them and other such things, like, as we saw, computers, um, or, um, you know, or, or game theory's approach to the world, which is a different thing from game studies altogether. Game theory being, of course, the idea that you can look at nuclear war, um, you know, real estate development, all kinds of real world phenomena through the lens of kind of a simple uh, gaming perspective and understand them in that way. Well, that's just saying everything is a game and it doesn't really quite get at what I'm talking about. It ends up ultimately either in this kind of undifferentiated idea of, of what's a game and what isn't, or in the kind of formalist, um, you know, as I said, butterfly collecting of, of ludology. Um, to elaborate a little more, play also cannot be reduced, then, is what I'm, I'm saying. It can't be put in terms of other phenomena. It can't be put in terms of narrative forms. Uh, or to take the case of psychology, there's a very tempting phenomenon uh, called flow, right, developed by Mihai Csikszentmihalyi, um, who looks at, you know, this sort of peak experience when we're most engaged with activity. Um, and it turns out mostly that's in games, but he also finds it in people on the job. Um, and, you know, that people are in this state of flow, even when they're working on assembly lines. He's found this. He's documented this. Um, and it's tempting, as someone who's trying to understand games, to say, well, play is nothing more than the state of flow. But this is insufficient, too. This fails for various reasons, including contradictions within Csikszentmihalyi's own work, um, where he was sort of, you know, he would periodically poll people who were on the job um, and, you know, find out how they were feeling. And very often they were in flow, you know, and so that was great. You know, they were doing things without a sense of I'm doing this for money. Um, but if, if he asked them, well, where would you rather be now? Would you like to be right here in the state of flow or, or would you rather be at home vegging out? They always wanted to still be at home. You know, there's, there's something about leisure and play that can't just be, you know, reduced to flow. Uh, and there are also many phenomena in actual game playing that aren't that fun. You know, if you look at these games of World of Warcraft, um, there's a lot of stuff that's hard to say is really quite that sort of peak experience. It is very repetitive. It does not fit, you know, with the standard things that are supposed to induce flow. So finally and most importantly, what I'm arguing here as, as a more productive approach for game studies um, 
is, is this idea that games cannot be contained either. Play cannot be contained in the realm of the cultural form, right? This is what everybody's trying to say. It's the biggest, you know, it's a big cultural form. It's bigger than the movies and all that stuff. What I'm suggesting and what the phenomena of the gold farms and other things emerging out of, uh, out of the world of gaming suggests is that it's, it's not productive just to look at these things as cultural forms. The narratology versus ludology bait debate had this limitation. Its ultimate limit was that whereas narratologists were saying that, you know, games do refer to the world, they refer to things out there, whereas ludologists were saying, no, they refer only to themselves or they refer to nothing, it was all about reference. They were not saying that games are of the world. They were not saying that play is of the world. Um, they were saying there is this world of games and culture and signification over here, and it refers out to the, the historical world out here. Classic case is the game scholar Janet Murray, who did an analysis of Tetris as, you know, uh, sort of representative of right, Tetris. Everyone knows this, right? Completely abstract game. How could you possibly find meaning in this other than, you know, it's a bunch of blocks falling down. You got to. Well, Janet Murray said, no, it's representative of, you know, the overworked state of, you know, postmodern production under contemporary capitalism. Um, and, you know, if you, it, it can be developed. It's not a completely silly idea, but the, the, the ludologist jumped all over this and said, no, it does not represent this. It's about blocks falling and having to, you know, fit them in. And so that's an interesting debate, but what I would say is you're both falling short. Tetris is not about capitalism in some representational way, some allegorical way. Allegory is another big favorite with game students, game scholars, you know. Let's look at games as referring to something else out in the world. No, Tetris is not about capitalism. It is of capitalism. It is of a piece with a capitalism that is transforming itself into the image of the game and, and incorporating elements of play in very deep, weird ways. Um, so to put it, to bring it back to Marx, you know, the standard sort of Marxist cultural analysis of almost anything cultural is, well, you know, culture is important. It reflects what's going on in the deepest uh, economic levels. Um, it, uh, it can in some ways shape what's going on at the deepest economic levels. But, and this is the famous phrase of Marx, in the final analysis, it is the base that determines, you know, where history is going. And I would say that's fine. But play cannot be contained in the superstructure. It is part of the base, increasingly. And uh, if you start from that, then you're able to talk about ways in which games matter beyond just you know, what they signify, how they signify. Not that these are not important things to pursue, they are, especially because understanding the form and function of games in their local playing is going to help us you know, understand how they are shaping things at the economic base as well, how they are shaping things in a deeper way. Um, and so that's my takeaway. Um, I have more to say um, about, you know, who I think is out there trying to, um, you know, do this kind of understanding of games and play. Uh, you know, the situationists who picked up on Heisinger uh, uh, aimed toward that, but were kind of naive about the transformative utopian nature of play. Uh, Ken Wark, Mackenzie Wark, who um, I quoted at the beginning, um, and who I quote here again mainly just to put up this wonderful quote in which he's talking about the problems with a lot of contemporary analyses of power, you know, is like, so you have 
game theory, which is based on the prisoner's dilemma, ultimately, right? You know, you all know that from game theory. It's just about two guys in jail trying to... That's the sort of or example of game theory and where it all follows from, and so that's based on two guys in jail. And then you have Foucault, who's got this whole theory of the disciplinary society and how power works in contemporary society, and that's all based on this idea of panopticon, which is a thing in the middle of a, a prison somewhere, and how that gets transformed and so forth. And, and, and what work is suggesting is that those models, uh, you know, which are very dungeony, um, uh, don't really work for a society and a culture in which lines of power are increasingly being organized along more game-like ways. So too much dungeon, not enough Dungeons and Dragons. I enjoy that. Um, but for, for my mind, there's not enough Dungeons and Dragons in, in works analysis, and, and we can talk about that. But, but for now, I'd like to let other people take the stage um, and uh, leave you with another sort of analogy, koan here, um, suggests that you know, if game studies uh, can draw on the worldliness, the worldly significance of games um, to become what it really can be, um, it might end up being a pursuit of knowledge as rich and productive as thermodynamics was, which drew on the worldly power of steam but led to many, many, many other conclusions. <laughs>